Hello, welcome to a new episode of Talk Turkey. Um, you know, we've been talking about Turkish politics and we have been we have been talking about the Turkish opposition and we'll keep talking about the Turkish opposition because another election is um, nearing in Turkey, the local elections. So we're going to take a look at the latest in Turkish politics. Yes, Nash, we are approaching to the end of year and we are here again with a new episode, also uh, a very Alaturka problem as well, uh, because we'll be talking about this electoral alliances. I mean, that's common in many countries, but in Turkey, it has also become problematic, just like many other issues, uh, because there are some fundamental problems, actually. Uh, why we have, why we need actually those uh, alliances in Turkey. Maybe a very brief uh, background I can start with and then we can yeah. delve into the, the details. I mean, we need electoral alliance in Turkey mainly because uh, of the new system, because uh, as our viewers know, there is a presidential system in Turkey. It's also a rather unique one. We have it since the referendum in 2017. Uh, so according to the system, uh, you also need uh, more than 50% of the voters to be elected as the president. So probably the logic behind this was that pro uh, probably uh, President Erdogan thought that he could easily get more than 50% because he is doing very well in terms of this polarizing electoral strategies uh, and he thought it would be easy. But he also quickly realized that Maybe it's not so easy. Uh, and then he became very dependent on electoral alliances. Uh, if you go back to 2002, he came to power as prime minister with only 34% of the votes. Uh, but now even 49%, even 50% percent, even percent, uh, is not enough. He needs to go beyond. That's why first he needed the support of uh, MHP, uh, Nationalist Party. And for 2023, even the support of MHV was not enough, so uh, he had to reach out to some uh, small and even marginal parties too. Uh, there was also another element, I think, under this alliance strategy for President Erdogan, uh, especially in 2017-18. He thought that he could have an alliance with the MHP, but the opposition couldn't manage to uh, form such alliances. And as long as this is the case, he would always win. So that was another uh, winning strategy probably in his mind. However, opposition parties also saw this risk and uh, they also see it as an opportunity and they also started to cooperate. And this cooperate was even so successful that in 2019 elections, uh, we had a important uh, victory of the opposition, especially in the, in the big cities in Turkey. But it is becoming increasingly a complex process. We are talking about electoral alliances, not coalition governments, just to underline this, because such alliances are much more complicated than uh, probably the coalition alliances, coalition governments. For example, in Germany, I mean, you can end up as Greens and Liberals in the same coalition, and that's totally fine. But can you really imagine these two parties coming together for electoral uh, alliance and campaigning together, it would be really impossible because there are really fundamental differences and political campaigns are usually based on such differences. So such alliances force all political parties into a very similar line. It restricts political choices of the parties. It restricts even the more natural cooperation sometimes we've been ideologically more like-minded uh, parties as well. So it is in a way a forced way of alliance. Uh, parties are doing it because they have to do it, because it's logical. Uh, and it is also sort of distracting this colorful political scheme as well, because all parties are becoming similar to each other. So, uh, and also it leads to a point that where small parties have become so important. I mean, one may think that it can be even good uh, for democratic representation, but uh, the system is giving those parties really power, 
far beyond their actual strength. It has uh, really become a business, like very small parties are just there negotiating their power uh, and then negotiating with different alliances to get the best deal, sort of. Um, so there are really big problems connected to it. And I, I tried to summarize it in a nutshell. Um, I'm sure there are other problems that you may, uh, you may add or maybe you disagree with some of them. Um, I don't know. What do you think? No, 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 I don't disagree. Of course. I mean, uh, this was a good summary. Summary. I just want to add, uh, you know, one, one more a couple of points, basically. So the thing is actually, well, to understand the system, in a sense, we probably we have to go back to 2007, because uh, before that, the Turkish state, basically, the regime was like, it was a it was a parliamentary system, right? We had a parliament, uh, a prime minister, and then there was the president. But prior to 2007, basically, the president was like a a bipartisan person who represented the state, uh, you know, non-party. Before 2007, I mean, even before my I mean, it's just that it, 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 they used to be like former soldiers or whatnot, a former bureaucrat, that 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 type of person, like a wise man, you know, sitting in, in a chair and balancing out politics, and you know, uh, you know, it was that sort of format. But in 2007, um, we had a, a you know secular classical president Ahmed Necdet Cesar. His term was up, and then we needed we needed a new president. Basically, Abdullah Gül's name came came up. He was one of the founders of AK Party. He was very close uh, confidant um, of of uh, uh, President I mean, uh, Erdogan. Uh, he was he was back then prime minister, and so Abdullah Gül would be the president. And back then, the president was elected by the by the parliament. But there was a problem back then because Abdullah Gül his wife was wearing a veil and Turkey was a more strict secularist state back then. So this was a problem. Uh, there were lo long discussions and this and that. Eventually he became a president. But then the idea of public electing the president came up because, you know, the, the discussion was, well, OK, if this chair is representing the state, the state is owned by all public, not a segment uh, of the Turkish society. So. Why not people are choosing their president, whether their their wife is veiled, whether they're themselves veiled or whatnot, if they're conservative, if they're secularist, whatever the public should elect. And then the, the system was changed and, you know, the president started to be elected. But then this caused, of course, a dilemma. You know, you have a president being elected by, by, by the people and then you have a parliamentary system. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to balance it out, you know, because then the president and the prime minister um, who's going to do what, you know, the both are elected, who's representing whom, it became a little chaotic. And step by step, we came to today's system, which is called the Turkish, Turkish style uh, presidential system. Well, when you look at Turkey from outside, I understand it looks like, OK, there's this guy Erdogan and some Imamoğlu now, Istanbul mayor against him, whatever. But it's not that simple, obviously. As you stated, there are uh, other actors, other effective actors in Turkish politics smaller parties, smaller movements, uh, maybe, but some of them really effectful on Turkish state and also Turkish society. One key actor, I would say uh, the leader of MHP, the Nationalist Party, Devlet Bahçeli, actually, he came up with the idea of this style of a presidential system because he came up and he said, well, basically, people are electing, electing the president. This is a chaotic system. Let's switch the system. Let's alter the system and have a, have a presidential system. And then Erdogan jumped on the on the boat, obviously. So, I mean, I'm not, I, maybe I have a little, uh, you know, I just want to put that note. I mean, if Erdogan, even back then, was comfortable with this getting the, you know, to, to, in order to become president, you have to get more than 50% of the votes. Actually, when you look at the recent Turkish history, Tur Erdogan never almost got like 50%, even in the parliamentary system, you know. He, he, he barely, you know, like, I think his record was, he, he once got close to 50%, but then usually, um, you know, it's like around 30%. So, but then he jumped on the boat and now it's problematic for him. And actually, a few a couple of weeks ago, he came up with the idea, he was traveling somewhere and again, he was coming back talking to the journalists in his presidential plane. And he said, uh, basically, he said, well, well, you know what? Actually, this system, uh, we have to alter this system. This has a lot of disadvantages. So this 50 plus one is not good for anyone. We have to change the system. Like, for example, whoever gets most of the votes should become the president. Let's switch the system to that. He came up with that idea. But 
the head uh, of the Nationalist Party, Devlet Bahçeli, he came up and he said that's basically not acceptable because we're electing the president, not anybody else. Um, so the president has all the powers, very strong character, very strong um, political actor in Turkey's system. So if you want to be this strong, you have to be getting more than 50% of the vote. That's how it goes, David Bahçeli said. And now, for now, this discussion is off the shelves. But, I mean, we're, we're nearing the local elections, not the presidential elections. The presidential elections will be 2000. 28, maybe by then this um, discussion will resurface because it's really hard for any political actor to get more than 50% of the votes, you know, because we kind of point that out uh, most of the time. Turkish society is a very, very fragmented society in many ways. Yeah, but I mean, eventually they do in the second round, but of course, uh, they have to give some concessions. I mean, we also saw in the in the last presidential elections, even the in the opposition, the opposition's candidates, even a few days before the second round, even he had to sign up for a secret deal, what we learned afterwards, uh, with this anti, uh, anti-refugee anti uh, victory party. So it is really pushing uh, leaders to, to find deals with even, even some marginal parties. Um, and we see the consequences of this nowadays. I mean, there are uh, major consequences for the opposition as well, because there's electoral alliances they sort of survive bef- uh, beyond the elections as well um, and when you have this alliance for the presidential and then you sort of continue and especially for the opposition they saw that uh, it worked well in 2019 municipal elections too uh, that's why the expectation was that probably uh, we would have this uh, sort of alliance for the municipal elections too but uh, it becomes more and more complicated uh because uh this electoral alliance has two main components chp uh the central left main opposition party and e party headed by uh Ms. mrs actioner you can see also on your on your screens so uh mr Rosell is the new president of the of the party and he visited her and he also offered that let's rediscuss this because e party was not willing to uh, continue this uh, this alliance uh, because of the problems in the presidential uh, election process. Uh, but the party refused again. They discussed in their board and they they refused it. Uh, so basically, we are facing at the moment with a point that uh, at least opposition's electoral alliance is collapsing. Uh, of course, it's not that straightforward. Uh, we still have time for elections. There is also a lot of pressure coming from public. And also the collapsing part is, we should note that, is between CHP and E-Party. But as we discussed in the last episode, uh, CHP is also becoming more and more uh, a social democrat party again. So uh, they are also reaching out to, uh, for example, the Kurdish voters, uh, pro-Kurdish head up as well. Uh, so we can also see some other forms of, if not electoral alliances, uh, we may still see some sort of cooperation as well in certain cities between different parties in the opposition. Uh, I mean, you also mentioned that there are problems within the ruling alliance as well. Uh, They are not free from problems, Uh, but at least they've decided to go ahead uh, with uh, with the municipal elections too, the AKP and the nationalist MHP. Um, They will not, as far as I understand, include those smaller parties uh, for this alliance, uh, probably they needed them more for the presidential elections. And as far as I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but MHP is also uh, rather unhappy about the involvement of uh, some of those parties. But as you mentioned, this 50% issue uh, is one of the fundamental problems. Uh, MHP leader really actually rejected in a in a very harsh manner. And he also said many other things. So. Uh, potentially there are also other problems in that alliance. Of course, we don't hear them. We don't know much about what's going on. Uh, We don't even know, actually, to a certain extent, the influence of MHP, because uh, usually two leaders are coming together. They are discussing uh, matters, but we don't know much about how this alliance is working, because it's not only an electoral alliance. It also continues, as they said, uh, after the elections, too. 
So it means we are talking about some sort of de facto coalition in Turkey, but we don't know the real dynamics behind and what sort of problems they are facing as well. So uh, that's why I think this electoral alliances are becoming a major issue for, for both sides. I mean, that 50% statement coming from Erdogan actually it states a major problem because obviously he wouldn't want to be dependent on uh, MHP or even those smaller parties. Uh, he wants to get rid of this, uh, but it's not, of course, so easy. Now he's so so dependent on them that even to change this, uh, there is this sort of dependency. I mean, it can be even interesting that actually he can, he can even reach out to uh, some opposition parties because uh, there's also uh, people in the opposition, including the CHP, they believe that the system is problematic. So uh, we may see, as you said, such discussions maybe uh, before uh, the next presidential elections as well. Uh, but the main focus is, of course, for now is the is the municipal one. Um, do, do you think this uh, the collapse of the opposition alliance would really influence the results? I mean, uh, or could could the opposition can still be very successful in this municipal election? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this picture probably we want to. I just want to elaborate a little bit on this picture. This is the new chair of CHP, Özgür Özel, uh, basically being a guest to E Party leader Meral Akşener, bringing him him a bouquet of white flowers. And I actually searched what does white flowers mean. Apparently, you know, like they say, like red roses, they indicate love. Like if you are in love with someone, you say you just send them an, an, an odd number, right? Not even odd number of red flowers. I think something like that. Uh, but like white flowers, apparently they're a symbol of like making peace. You know, like let's make peace type of thing. So he brought this white uh, bouquet of flowers, but... Uh, E-Party decision is simple and final. E-Party does not want to be uh, in an alliance with CHP. E-Party will run on their own uh, this time in every city. There are 81 cities in Turkey and 1,000 something something districts. So and they will really say it. final. I mean, it's Turkish politics. You're right, but it'll. So far, it looks like that. Yeah. But I mean, uh, I had a meeting with the head, with two heads, their co-chairs. I mean, co-chairs of the Kurdish party, Hedef, and they have spoken to the press, and they are saying, well, basically, we have a backlash from our voters too, because since 2015, basically, we have been against Erdogan, uh, no matter what, supporting the opposition coalition or opposition parties in Turkey. We did not demand anything. But as a result, basically, we did not receive any support uh, from the so-called opposition. You know, their main problem, Kurdish party's main problem is in the in the eastern cities, like the, where the Kurdish population is more dense. Obviously, in the local elections, people elect HEDEP uh, mayors. But what AK Party did in the last term, people were electing a mayor, and then AK Party was basically, with most of them apparently appeared to be sham trials, removed those mayors and appointed trustees instead of them. So like governors of many cities became also the mayors of those cities. And, you know, that like people were wondering then why are we electing? Because I'm saying sham trials because some of these people are were accused of being terrorists or, you know, um, being corrupt, whatnot. But that at, the, at the end of the day, most of these court cases ended and most of these uh, HDP mayors were found not guilty. So, you know, they're just four years were stolen, basically. They were just accused of being I don't know, terrorist traitors, whatnot. Most of them basically, you know, walked free at the end of the day. So, but then this, you know, Kurdish party, they say, I mean, the, we supported the opposition, but against this trustee policy, the opposition did not even say anything. But as far as I understood, in between the lines, the Kurdish parties, like kind of, they are open to, uh, you know, co collaborate in a sense. In at least some of the main cities like Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, maybe. I mean, obviously in the eastern cities, they're going to have their own candidates because they're the most likely to win. But for example, with Ekrem Imamoğlu, I understand maybe they might support him. It depends. So the bargaining has started. And now E-Party is saying clearly, no, we will not be in any collaboration with you guys. We're going to run on, run on our own. 
now it's easier for uh, the Kurdish party and CHP to basically start working on or start cooperating on many issues because it was really hard for CHP in a sense to balance out. There's one Turkish Nationalist Party and there's one Kurdish Nationalist Party and CHP trying to balance them out. But then on the other hand, not all CHP voters are really sympathetic towards the Kur Kurdish movement in Turkey. Again, it's not going to be easy be easy for CHP to juggle those out. But yeah, I mean, the, the system, I understand, the system has its own problems, but you also have to have to face the fact that Turkey, this, this is Turkey, right? I mean, I'd say like close to 40% secularist, be it nationalist secularist, or be it more, I don't know, like left secularists. This is like chunk, good chunk, like 40, almost 40% 40 of society. And you have 10% really hardcore religious, almost Salafist people. Some of them don't even go and vote. We say close to 30% AK Party voters, you know, a smaller percent of nationalist Islamist, like around 10% again. I mean, more or less, some of them are Kurds also. And you have, we have close to 10% basically Kurdish votes. That's the that's the Turkish society. It's, I mean, in the scheme, it's really hard to get 50%, no matter what, who you are. I mean, be it Erdogan, be it whatever. I don't know. I mean, now people are hopeful for maybe Ekrem Imamoğlu is an interesting figure. Yeah, so, I mean, coming back to local elections, local elections are different than presidential elections because people really vote for their local problems most of the time. For example, in Istanbul, I'd say the, the main problem was transportation. One thing Ekrem Imamoğlu did very successfully was basically he really improved the metro lines. Um, yeah, there's no Ekrem Imamoğlu here. Uh, the metro lines in, Ist in Istanbul, basically with, with metro system, you can go anywhere in Istanbul. It's a huge city and there is traffic 24-7. Taxis don't work. It's, they're a mafia on their own. That's another subject. But, you know, for example, that or to poorer families, they reached. Uh, a lot of help, help. they reached uh, out to, to poorer families, basically Imamolo and his team. So he looks advantages right now, even if E-Party does not support him. But of course, it all depends. You know, it all depends. So we don't still know who is going, going to be the candidate of E-Party. But th there is one important detail, I'd say. Um, up until now, AK Party has not announced their candidates for big cities, Istanbul, Ankara, you know, Izmir is they don't they don't really have a chance to win but they did not announce their istanbul candidate because um the deadlock for them is ekrem imamoğlu the chp mayor he's a star figure right he's like a star you know he's a very forefront figure he has his own character whatnot he, and he's like a de facto co-chair of chp right now so who's going to run against him in istanbul for ak party i mean if you look for like a rock star figure like him, it doesn't really sit well with the AK Party a, a construction. AK Party is Erdogan's party. He's the only star. Nobody can outstar him in the party, you know. So who are they going to come up with? They are saying maybe Selçuk Bayraktar, you know him from the Bayraktar drones. He's happened to be also the son-in-law of Erdogan. They're maybe mentioning him. He might, you know, run for mayor he might have a chance because among the young people he's very popular uh, with this techno fest he has this tech technology festival uh, obviously uh, supported by the state and his bayraktar drones and whatnot you know there is this not the other of, sort of techno when you said techno fest no not raving <laughs> no, not really a party like no this, this is technology so yeah i mean he's kind of but I don't know if he, because if he loses against a criminal, it will look really, really bad. But though, one other really important point, I mean, if a criminal wins the Istanbul elections again, okay, we're saying this is a local election, this is only for Istanbul, but if he wins again, this will look really bad for our party. And the opposition thinks if they win Istanbul and Ankara again, then... Uh, our party government cannot just sit there anymore. Uh, maybe the idea of early elections will come up. So again, I mean, every election is very, very crucial in Turkey, as you know. And so, yeah, these are what's being talked about. Yeah, maybe I can one one point as well. Also, uh, Jumuriyet newspaper reported a few days ago that uh, AKP did also this public opinion survey in Istanbul to find which candidate would be most popular and would have a chance. And they are a bit like deadlock there, is, is, as you said, because even the most popular one uh, could get up to 40% of the vote, and which may not be uh, enough. 
So that's why um, they are struggling a bit. And it's new because for the presidential elections, actually, the, the, the government was sort of accusing coalition, uh, the, the opposition, that they couldn't find the candidate until the very last minute. And now it's happening to uh, the government, actually, because we know the opposition's uh, candidates. It's Ekrem Yamamola, for sure, at least for the main opposition party and potentially, as you said, supported by the by the Kurdish party as well. Uh, but we don't know about uh, the government's one. So uh, and maybe a last thing also, if all opposition, all uh, alliance options fail, I also agree that the uh, opposition voters may also uh, find the best candidates themselves as well, because uh, we may have serious problems in terms of democracy in Turkey, but the voters are actually very experienced especially when it comes to voting. So they may also vote tactically, like uh, consolidate votes around the most popular one, especially in cities like, I think, Istanbul and Ankara. Uh, we may see that, and there will be more and more pressure also coming to uh, probably other countries, uh, other um, parties as well. So uh, I don't know, we'll, we will need to see also the candidates of, for example, the party, whether they will have really strong candidates in those cities, or they will have candidates, but rather minor ones. So that will also have the influences. But uh, it's going to be, it seems, another exciting election. And we will continue to discuss all these dynamics. Um, but probably also this is our last episode in 2023. So uh, we'll be back uh, hopefully in, in January. So um, if you don't have anything to add, maybe we can Yes. Happy holidays to our viewers. Happy and... holidays, and I want to make the classical joke. See you next year, Murat. Aha. <laughs> See you next year. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Bye.